Good afternoon and welcome to The Upside. I'm Jonathan Oleski with Jaymore and our show is about to begin. It is my pleasure to introduce our two wonderful hosts today, Beth Goldsmith, Chair-Elect of the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore and Dr. Scott Rifkin, publisher of Jaymore. Beth and Scott, take it away. Thanks, Jonathan, and welcome again to The Upside. This is our virtual show brought to you by the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore and Jaymore Magazine to keep our Baltimore Jewish community informed during these uncertain times. We come to you twice a week with episodes you can view live on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. Each episode will tackle some of today's most pressing topics, feature some of the community's leading experts, and answer questions that are on all our minds. Today, we will be talking about the loss of a loved one during the pandemic. Because of the limitations imposed on us by social distancing, rituals that have traditionally provided support during this emotionally challenging time have now been upended. From private funerals to online shiva to the inability to sit by the bedside of a dying family member, mourners are finding it harder than ever to find comfort. What are we doing as a community to create new rituals and provide emotional support to help our grieving families and friends? Scott, would you like to introduce our guest? Sure, thanks Beth. Uh, we're thrilled to welcome Matt Levinson, president of Saul Levinson and Donna Kane, who's a grief specialist for the Associated Jewish, uh, Jewish Community Service, Associateds, gotta get the parentheses in there, right? The uh, common there, right? Uh, Jewish Community Services. For the past several years, JCH and Saul Levinson have collaborated on a number of grief support programs for the community. And last month, the two organizations teamed up with the Baltimore Jewish Council and the Baltimore Board of Rabbis to host a virtual community-wide memorial, remembering those who have passed away during the pandemic. So Beth, you wanna kick off the questions? Sure, um, let's jump right in and say, so Matt, Welcome, and how are you helping families grieve during this time of social distancing? Uh, thanks for having me. Um, it, it's been a difficult time the last few months. We've made a lot of changes. Our, our goal is number one, to keep everyone safe and healthy, but also be able to have a proper Jewish burial. So, you know, we immediately shut down our building. Um, we have very few staff members that are working we're starting to bring back a few more people, but mostly our, our staff is working from home. We've been having private graveside services. The, the state has mandated us to have 10 or less people. So it's difficult for family members, um, but, but we, we've been having 10 or less people at the cemetery. And we just started today. We have an outdoor chapel at our funeral home. It's, we've, we've converted a large carport into a mini chapel with 20, 15 to 20 people. Um, it's allowing us to have a live webcast. So in the summer when it's very hot or if it's raining, they'll be able to have uh, a service. That, that um, sounds we, like, that, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and we're, we're going to continue to make changes al along the way and, you know, whatever we're able to do to, to help families, we will. I really love hearing about that little outside chapel. I think that sounds like a really great first step toward us being able to get together again. Donna, did you want to talk to us a little about what's going on? Sure. Um, it's, it, as Matt said, it has been challenging to meet the needs of people who are, uh, grieving now because of all of the regulations and safety measures put in place. Uh, we transitioned very quickly um, in March to grief support groups that are over Zoom, which um, <clears throat> certainly is different for people, but um, people do report feeling relief. They still have a, a community that um, they can talk with and bond with. Um, everyone's journey is a little bit different, but um, having the support of other people that have gone through this, especially in this time, is invaluable. So um, we are running groups monthly, uh, which have been well utilized. Uh, we're starting another one the 23rd of June. Um, and we're reaching out with specific grief programs too, like the memorial program, which um, 
I think was viewed by over 300 people, Matt. I don't want to exaggerate. Um, and um, also the feedback that we got was just, um, it was very obvious that we met a need in the community. People were thanking us for giving them closure um, because they didn't have a, a memorial service yet or they may not have one. Um, so that was very, very helpful as well. So Matt and Donna, I, I'm a physician, so I've spent most of my career trying to reduce your caseload. So this is an unusual conversation for me. But let me ask a question. We have patients in nursing homes that are now passing away alone and their families aren't there and in hospitals with their families not there. So how does that impact what each of you is doing? We hear it all the time. Um, when someone passes away now, you know, we, we talk to families that, that have said they haven't seen their loved one in weeks, which is heartbreaking. Um, so we try to give them an opportunity to come in and have a private, spend some private time with their loved one at our funeral home. Um, you know, not having the community surrounding them is hard and, and they feel isolated and it's very challenging for them. So we just try to do what we, we can to, to help them. Donna, how's it impacted what you're doing and working Absolutely. with the families? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we do uh, in conjunction with Levinson's is when um, there's someone who really needs outreach and support, uh, Matt or someone on the staff will contact me and I can reach out to that person, offer consultation to that person, we can um, offer resources for them as well to keep to keep them uh, to keep them connected. Um, there's also uh, being a physician, you could probably relate to this. There's also an increase in depression and anxiety that we're seeing um, in our population, and for for good reason. And so that also adds another layer. Um, to what is already a very unique um, grieving situation. Very good. Beth? It, um, I, I want to step in a little further with the unique <coughs> situation. We've heard a lot about virtual Shiva, and I guess I would let each of you sort of comment on how really does that work, and how can someone decide if it's right for their family to try it. Matt, you wanna start? Sure, sure. So, you know, we, we go over this with each family. Obviously, you know, people are not having their, the community come to their house for a traditional Shiva. So we bring up this virtual Shiva. It's usually through Zoom or, or a different platform similar to Zoom. And um, I'd say half the families are, are doing this. Some families, they just have a private family Shiva you know, maybe they, they call their rabbi and have a service. Some families, they are opting for this and they set up a, essentially a Zoom um, meeting, you know, at a certain time for, for three days or up to seven days, depending on what they want. We put that information on our website and the rabbi is a participant and they have a Shiva service and, you know, people in the community can, can view it. I, I think there's going to be lots of changes even when this is all over and I could see us families using these types of, of technology even after this is done for family members that have to go back to where they live or or family members that can't come to the funeral I could see them having a regular shiva with with it being zoomed also and at least this allows the members of the community that can't be there for the family to to be there virtually Donna, did you have anything to add on that? Um, I think that there are still personal things that uh, you can do, even if you're um, attending Shiva um, over Zoom. Uh, certainly, you can write a note to the family. Um, people love hearing personal stories about their loved ones. So if you have a story, send them the story. You can still put Shiva baskets out on the patio or have them um, or flowers, whatever you want. There's still thoughtful things that you can do that's 
a personal touch um, to help people feel um, embraced by the community and also that their loved ones are being remembered and honored. Talk about support groups, if you would. I know that was a, a question that we wanted to, to bring up. Okay. Talk about that, that sort of a thing. So we have been running support groups for about 10 years now. And originally we would do one group a year and um, it has grown exponentially to five or six groups a year. And people, um, tend to get a very good result from a group as opposed to um, individual therapy. I mean, that's helpful, but the groups sort of normalize what their people are going through um, in a better way because they see other people going through what they're going through. Um, the groups are homogenous. So if somebody lost a parent, they would be in a group where other people have lost a parent. If someone lost a spouse, they would be in a spouse group. Because while every loss is um, difficult, people grieve differently. You're gonna grieve differently for your parents than um, your mom or dad would grieve for their spouse. So we feel like that is a very important part of um, what makes our groups um, somewhat unique. And we meet weekly for eight weeks and talk about different aspects of grief and loss and also give people time to um, talk about their own concerns and needs and get support from everyone else in the group. So they, they, they work very well for people who are able to talk about their grief. People who prefer to do things to um, work through their grief may need a different modality um, than just uh, talking. Okay. So this is obviously a very difficult and very heavy subject. Let's take a break from the heavier questions for a minute. Can you tell us a little bit, I, I see this big nice sign behind you with uh, Jewish Community yeah, Services and all the services of, of, of JCS. Why don't you spend a minute telling us about JCS and, and its services, not just what you do, but wrap that into it if you would. Sure, thank you for giving me that opportunity. Um, so we are a comprehensive human service agency. So what that means is that we provide services um, for young children all the way up to um, our elder care um, uh, department where, um, so it goes from, you know, children all the way up to older adults. We provide um, therapy services with uh, licensed therapists. We provide um, transportation sometimes for people if they need transportation. Things have changed because of COVID. So we're working on outreach to make sure that everyone is doing well, um, has what they need. We have, um, if you're having difficulty with um, paying your bills, there's people here to talk to about that. And then we have programs to meet the needs of, of the community that we develop um, yearly. For example, um, the memorial program that we um, had last month. Very good. And, and, and how many people work for JCS? Um, this is a guess, about 250 people. Yeah, it's a big organization. It's a big organization. It goes, yeah. it goes great work. So that Thank sign you. behind you is great. We can sit there and read off the bullet points. Thank you. Um, so let me switch this over to Matt for a minute. And again, keeping you know, Matt, your your family uh, has been involved in in uh, uh, the, the burial process and grieving and all of that for a long time, um, and has pretty much seen and, and really serves the community as sort of a sole provider. I mean, folks have come and gone, but. Levinson's is always there. Take a minute, if you would, and tell us a little bit about the history of Levinson's, and then we'll come back to today's subjects a little bit. Sure. So our, our company started in 1892, 
and uh, I'm the fifth generation, so we've had many family members over the years. Are, we're very proud to keep it in our family and keep the tradition going. We've all worked together and we enjoyed working as a family. The, each generation teaches the next. Um, I currently work with my dad and my cousin, Ellen Sue, and um, we have a great team. We have around 50 employees, wonderful funeral directors and support staff. And our, our goal is to really just be there for family members, help people through a difficult time, provide a high level of service, and just, just take care of people. And um, it's been hard to do that the last few months. It's, it's, it's challenging. This is definitely the, the most challenging part of my career. Um, but we're, we're getting through it and we're, we're here to help. We're a full service funeral home. We, we essentially, our goal is when someone passes away, they give us a call and we do everything. We don't want them to have to think about anything. We hold their hand and, and help them through the entire process. Is there any institutional memory of the last pandemic we had 100 years ago? Is there any family history on that? No, someone asked me that a few weeks ago. I, I don't. I asked my dad. He, he, was, he, he wasn't you know, old enough or wasn't in the business at that point. My uncle Stanley, who just passed away in September, um, I wish he was around right now because he would be able to, he had, he had the, the best memory and he'd probably be able to, to share some, some thoughts, but no, we don't. Yeah, it'd be interesting to hear how these same issues were addressed without the technology that we have today. You know, and whether they were addressed or whether people just went on and did what they normally did. So who knows? It'd be interesting right. to pull those records. Very good. Beth, do you have other questions? I, I do. I, I'd like to know from the point of view, um, Donna, I'll, I'll start with you. You can share personally and also from the other staff members, the professionals working at JCS. How is that impacting you guys certainly making your job more difficult whatever but share a little please about what that's like to be on that front line um that's a very thoughtful question thank you for asking um we are very lucky that and i know it sounds cliche but it really is true um, because we are all very uh, community oriented and compassionate people, uh, we look to each other for support. And um, we know when we're starting to feel a little bit overwhelmed, when to withdraw a little bit and get some backup from a coworker. Um, we understand the concept of compassion fatigue. Uh, so when we see ourselves getting a little too cynical or being avoidant of things, we know we need to just go, go to a peer. So we're very lucky that we have a supportive community uh, all around us. Um, the uh, leadership here has done everything possible to make everyone uh, feel safe. So that alleviates a lot of, a lot of anxiety um, so I think we're, we struggle at times like everyone does, but we have a good um, support system right here. It's good to hear and, and, and so glad that you do have that. Matt, um, how about, you know, my dad used to be a lobby manager after he retired from all of his other life's work and it was his favorite job ever in his life. So. Um, you know, I know a little about the culture there at Levinson's. How is this impacting you guys? Sure. So, you know, we, you know, we, we wanted to make our staff feel comfortable. So the first thing we did was we, we essentially closed down our buildings. You know, we, we wanted everyone to, to be able to work from home. We changed our entire operation probably within five or six days to be able to, you know, we're not a type of business that usually you can work from home. So we changed the way we do things to be able to do that. And I know our, our staff appreciated that. Um, you know, our job is to take care of other people and we also need to take care of ourselves. And those first few weeks were, were very challenging and it's it's become more of the norm now, but we, we lean on each other. We have a great group of people. They are compassionate. Um, 
passionate about what they do and they're just trying to help people and they understand how hard it is right now. Um, but we're, we're just trying to put things in place to keep everyone safe and limit the exposure. We, we've been working in shifts. So, you know, we've always been thinking if something happened at work and someone got the virus, what would happen? Because we, we can't stop operating. So we've been working in shifts and um, just make sure everyone stays safe and limit the exposure at, at work. And I think and Matt, so. you can't exactly take your work home with you. So that wouldn't work very well. Um, how are the nursing homes and the hospitals to work with right now? Because things are obviously different. Yeah, uh, they've been great to work with. You know, uh, they had their own challenges. I mean, everybody this this kind of came up out of nowhere. But um, they've they've they they're doing everything they can. They're working with us. You know, usually when someone passes away, the family's at the the you know the hospital or the facility. That's not the case. Right now. So. You know, we have a great relationship with all the hospitals and nursing homes, and um, we're, we're taking all the, the proper precautions. They are, too, and we're just making sure that everyone stays safe. Very good. Scott, Beth, I actually have a question from Facebook, and, and we'll start with Matt, and then we'll go to Donna. So some, a viewer wants to know, are people planning additional gatherings to remember loved ones who have passed once those group restrictions that you talked about, Matt, are lifted? And how are you working with people to do this? I think it's a really interesting question. Yeah, you know, we've been offering from the beginning that if, because there's such limitations right now that they could have a future memorial service in our chapel when this is over. Very few people are interested in this. Um, what I see happening is I can see the unveiling becoming more of a, a funeral. So in a year from now, when they have an unveiling, that they would have maybe more people, maybe even use our chapel, which we'll certainly offer to each family beforehand. So other family members, friends, the rest of the community can participate and be involved. Well, that's very helpful. Donna, any thoughts on that? Any you know special observances after the restrictions are lifted? Have, have people asked you about that? Um, we've talked about it sometimes in group. And um, I think Matt, really um, spoke to what I'm hearing as well, that I, I think unveilings are going to become the time, hopefully, you know, a year from now or however many months, that the unveilings are gonna become more uh, the service. I would like to know when we talk about social distancing and how limited the graveside service actually is. If you could give some advice and maybe we'll start with Matt because this is your, your ballywick. If a friend's parent passes and I want to go because I feel close enough to it, can you give me some advice? How is that working? How do people know if they actually can go and what happens when I get there? Sure. So you know, the, the laws are changing. So as of today, the limit is still 10 people at the cemetery. That includes the rabbi and we, we consider one of our funeral directors. So the family could have eight people and we have to be strict with the eight people for everyone's safety. So, you know, I would tell a friend to talk to the family. The family essentially has to invite you. If people just come and we have had a couple funerals, I'd say 95% of all the services we've had Everyone's been very accommodating, listening to the rules. But every once in a while, we do have more people that show up. And when that number gets too high, we have to tell people to leave because we can't, first off, it's against the law. We have to have 10 or less people. The cemetery, the rabbi, our staff, everyone needs to be comfortable. So I would tell you to, to speak to the family. There are some times that close friends are included in that number of 10. We're hopeful that in the upcoming weeks, the, the state will, will change the, the rule on the gatherings and, or at least at the cemeteries, we could have more people because it is a challenge. You know, when, when you have, someone has a large family, they have to pick and choose who they can invite. And that is not easy to do. So um, we're hoping that we can increase that number. And this is one of the reasons we're now having these, this outdoor chapel at our funeral home because we are allowed to have more people there. So now the number instead of eight can be 15 to 20. Very good, very good. Why don't each of you give your contact information 
if you would, how the how the public, re I, you know, at Levinson's, I'm sure folks know, but, but if you'd be kind enough to give the contact information and, and, and then Donna do the same thing. Sure. My, so it's Matt Levinson, um, and it, you can email me at matt at sallevinson.com, call the funeral home 410-653-8900, or available 24 hours a day. Very good. Donna? Um, I can be reached at um, 410-843-7394, and also D D Kane K-A-N-E, at JCS Baltimore, you have to spell it all out, dot org. Very good. Beth, any other questions? Um, I, I, I guess I would love to leave on sort of a, a forward facing note. We talked a little bit about uh, certainly more people being allowed and um, the unveilings becoming important. Are there any other things, I, and this question is for each of you, are there any other things that you expect to see that will be different even after the pandemic? Um, I do think things are going to be different. I think there's going to be um, a different layer to um, everyone's grieving because we've never experienced this before. We're not exactly sure if it's going to make um, grieving uh, longer, more intense, um, if it's going to um, change how people um, mourn. Um, so um, my hope is that people understand that they're not alone and they do have services and support that they can um, avail themselves of both for um, like if both for the from the community and also individually, because um, I don't ever remember a time where um, we didn't have Shiva in my in my lifetime. I don't remember a time where we only had eight people at a at a funeral. And not only is there this community layer, but there's also a national layer for a lot of people who, um, a lot of people have died during this time. And that adds another layer to people feeling like their loved ones are not um, being recognized. So I, I can't tell you how it will play out, but I can tell you that um, we will do our best to um, support everyone and um, try to meet the community needs, which is what we're trying to do even now. Good. Matt? We, we hear from families all the time that they, they miss having the community um, be, sur be surrounded by the community during this difficult time. So when this is over, I, we expect um, funerals to go back to to the way they used to be, having regular chapel services. I can see technology playing a, a bigger role moving forward if it's during the funeral with webcasting. Um, definitely with Shiva, as I mentioned before. I, I do think we'll have traditional Shiva when this is over, but I can see having a an element of, of some type of virtual Shiva, especially for family members and friends that for many reasons are unable to attend. Good, 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 good. I, I think we have uh, hit all the major questions here and appreciate all your time. Beth, do you want to wrap things up? Sure. Um, I want to say thank you so much to both Matt and Donna. Thank you both for being here today. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult topic. It's a difficult job, uh, I know. And um, I, I really feel like people learned something today and, and hopefully it will help us all going forward. Our next show will be Thursday at seven o'clock and we'll be um, talking to Eddie Steinberg of JS Edwards and Lauren Rakovitz of A Style Studio about the retail environment in our neighborhood. I also wanna remind you to join the Associated for its virtual annual meeting on Wednesday, June 17th at 5.30. Special guests include Governor Larry Hogan, Senator Ben Cardin, 
and acclaimed filmmaker and Baltimore's very own Barry Levinson. So I will keep you informed as we get closer with more details and additional special guests. Finally, as always, continue to visit associated.org and jmoreliving.com for more information, stories, and resources. And I also anyway. want- Oh, sorry, I, Scott. That's okay, if I can jump in, I think we also have Freeman Rabowski for the following week, the, the uh, president of UMBC, which will yeah. be a fascinating discussion for anybody who has kids in school or anybody who's just fascinated by one of the most fascinating people in Baltimore. This is a young a, a gentleman who not only has led UMBC, but he, back in the 60s, he went to jail for his uh, uh, civil rights activity and spent time in, overnight in jail in one of the major protests. So I'd love to hear about that from him as well. It certainly um, relates to today's world. So that'll be a neat conversation. I hope folks will join us for that. Jonathan? Okay, well, so, yeah, Jonathan, right. do you want to tell us any more secrets? <laughs> well, that uh, we're, we're scheduled through uh, June 16th, as, as Scott said, with Dr. Freeman Rabowski from UMBC. We have uh, requests into other wonderful uh, people involved in the community. And as uh, we fill our dates, we'll be putting them out there. And just uh, again, thanks to Matt and Donna. And as Beth said, be sure to go to uh, associated.org, go come, sign up for the annual meeting and uh, go to jmoreliving.com and sign up for our newsletter. And thank you all and everyone have a safe day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.